You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Actually, Mark Allen, this just in. You know, we were talking about how, how long it can take records to click with yeah. you. You know, well, I just had a record click this week after, I think, well, probably 47 years. 47 what years. was it? <laughs> it's... Um, Neil Young's Tonight's the Night, which I've had since it came out in 1975. Oh, yeah, because you've told countless times the great story about him going out to promote that album. We played the whole of the album, didn't he? And then he came the back on again, which no one had heard at that point, and then came back on again and said, I'm going to play something you're familiar with and play Tonight's the Night. Play, yeah, play oh, him, no. so, play him something really they know, so he started again. That's right. Tonight's the Night. Um, anyway, I've always regarded that record as a little bit of a trial. Actually, you know, it is hard work. It's, it's, yeah, except something happened this week. I just played it, and suddenly it didn't sound like hard work. Oh, anymore. Amazing! It absolutely just clicked for me. And so I played, what sounded I, different about it? I played it about three times. I don't know. You know, the world changes. Your ears get changed. You know, I don't know what it is. You know, you, it's what you've listened to in the in the interim and all those kind of things. It just changes all the time. That's my point, you know, that you, you know, you may, uh, you may think I'll never get this record. And then one day you just do, you put it on you yeah. know, in, the, in the appropriate mood. Uh, I was it not feeling click forever. You may be connected. I, I think, I think I was actually. And when I say I was in the right mood, I wasn't in a suicidal mood or anything like no, that. No, no. You know? It's just absolutely fine. Try metal Saturday. machine music next and see how you go on with that. I'll let you know. So at the risk of this sounding like the weekly obituary show, we were talking last week about the uh, the death of Wilco Johnson. And this week, of course, the, the big story is the is the death of Christine McVie of Fleetwood Mac. You interviewed her not that long ago. I interviewed her. You're absolutely right. I interviewed her when we were at Word in 2004 um, in an amazing penthouse uh, flat high above uh, Battersea Bridge, kind of glass box looking out over London. It was amazing, actually. Oh, and I think she'd left the group in about, I can't remember, maybe about 98, and she didn't rejoin until 2014. But she was in that sort of weird interim period where she didn't want to be in Fleetwood Mac, and she was fed up with the touring and living out of a suitcase and just life on the road, just fed up with Fleetwood Mac generally. But I, I got the impression she didn't want to be at home either, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, there she was, rattling around inside this massive Tudor mansion with its kind of converted outbuildings with studios and making solo albums. And I think she just felt a bit kind of, she probably felt a bit lonely and a bit there. So she's that terrible situation. She'd love to, love to be back on the road with Fleetwood Mac, but didn't want to do it. No. And I thought she was so she was so interesting, really, really down to earth and really she's really got a regular. And she talked in great detail, which is the thing I was very interested in uh, about, actually, about life, um, you know, before and around the time of Chicken Shack. Chicken Shack's <laughs> 40 Blue, Blue Fingers, the first record I ever bought. You see, Mark Ellen is the, uh, is the, the secret Chicken Shack fan, and he was the person who said, now, the thing I really want to talk to you about, Christine, is being a member of Chicken Shack. I've got a new album. Up. All right, we'll come to that in a moment. Never Hold mind on. your multi-platinum yeah. years in the world's most no, successful I know, recording I know group. we did talk quite a bit never about mind <laughs> all, Never mind the fact you were all leaping into bed with each other all throughout the 70s yeah, and 80s. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about Stan Webb's you know, extending coaxial lead that used to allow him to play solos from out in the street. That's, That's the right. stuff you he wanted did. to talk He, he did. did. Okay. No, no, she was great about it. It's just an amazing. She's just she still referred to it as the underground. You know yes. that time when when you, you nobody you very very rarely played on the radio. You never Absolutely. got to tell unless you had a hit. And so she said, if you're in the underground, all you do is just live in vans, which is a kind of man's world. Very interesting that she was one of the very few women actually doing that. And she remembered just ploughing up and down the A1 in a coma van. She remembered Freddie King helping them mend a, a puncture. You know, it's oh, amazing. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Thing. I know, it's lovely. And everybody Freddie kind of King the bacon the, rolls. That's, and, the, uh, tit that's the title of this podcast. Freddie King mended a puncture. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. absolutely brilliant. I love well, that's that. Good. Isn't it? It's really good. And she can remember coming down from where she lived, which is near Birmingham. Birmingham, and, yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, in Birmingham at that stage. And she can remember coming down with her friend when she was 15. So this would have been, 
I don't know, what, 1959 Late, or something? Yeah, something Probably like 59. that. 59. They came down on the train. They were still at school, and they arrived at Two Eyes Coffee Bar in Soho with oh. their guitars. They said, can we get on the bill? They were put on the bottom of the bill. They were supporting the shadows were at the top of the bill. And they played with their they played their Everly Brothers songs. On, oh. and so it was amazing. So she was a real grafter, you know. That's fantastic. I, know, I never and, knew that. Oh yeah. And she said she, she they changed into their little uniforms. She said little red sweaters and matching black skirts. Oh, really? Well, uh, In the yeah, two eyes. That's fantastic. Two eyes coffee bar. Isn't that amazing? And then she told me the story about how um, which I think I she's told before she about how she was at Moses School of Art in Birmingham and then she graduated. She came down to London. She, she got did a job five as a window. years. This is yeah. Sorry, this I didn't interrupt. She did a five year sculpture degree course, didn't That's she? That's right. Yeah. Five which years. really amazed me. Yeah. Five years and then all that life after that. You know, yeah. go and carry on. So she did that. Yeah, and she, she, was did, a, she got a job at Dickinson Jones as a, as a window dresser. And she says that, and I want to believe this because it's such a great story. It's a real sliding doors moment. She'd been in a band, as you remember, with, with uh, Andy Sylvester, who was the bassist of Chicken Shack and with Stan Webb, called, I think, Sound of Blue. I can't remember now. Yes. The, yes. My, was, or Shades of Blue. What they called? Oh, know, blue, they called something like that, and um, yeah, and uh, anyway, she's got this job as, the, in the, as a window dresser, and she's dressing a window. So there's a knock on the glass, and there is Andy Sylvester, and he's waving at her, and he says, "Come on here." She says, "What are you doing?" He says, oh, I'm, yeah, "I'm in London now." Says, Great, we formed a band. We're called Chicken Shack. Why don't you come and be the piano player? Now, I want to believe that. This is a true story because I love the idea that that that, that I mean, you know, they could have possibly tracked her down before, but then they didn't know they were out of touch with her. They didn't know she was in London. Dickens so, and Jones is not it, been in, in the middle of Oxford. It, it's Oxford Street, isn't it? It's yeah, yeah. Perfectly, perfectly reasonable to you might meet somebody by window dressing in Oxford Street, mind you. Yeah, you might entirely, absolutely. But had she not been out there in the window at that moment and yeah, him not yeah. walking by, maybe none of this story would have happened. I want to believe that anyway. But no, was, she was brilliant about that whole period, which I I was very fond of because I love the idea that if you were a bit of a serious underground head like you and I were, you know, that the blues was this brilliantly uh, kind of earnest, kind of slightly dour, gritty. Well, it was the Blue Horizon you know, years, was the Blue Horizon was. doesn't doesn't mean anything to it to young folk, but yeah. it means something to people like you and me because. You know, Blue Horizon was a, a label started by Mike Vernon, who was the kind of producer engineer, and uh, and it was it was Fleetwood Mac, it was Chicken Shack, it was Jeremy Spencer, it was yeah. Dust, Duster Bennett, do yeah. we remember? And uh, he made this very particular kind of kind of Thames Delta blues, which he used to record really well, and yeah. uh, and these acts were, as you've said, kind of underground. Yeah, but they but you know Fleetwood Mac certainly had hits, really you know big hits, and um, and and Christine Perfect was kind of known because as much as anything else, because she was the only woman in that. In that whole scene. Well, yeah, she remembered winning the, I think it's the Melody Maker kind of yes. female vocalist. She said, she I said, terrific. She said, well, there really was no competition. It was me, Julie Driscoll. Julie Driscoll. And I think Sandy Dennis said, 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 we got a folk rock, but they were the only girls in rock at the time. There were quite a lot in America, but not in England at all. No, not at all. I'll tell you the thing I was, I was talking to somebody about last night. So in 1972, when I was at college, and there was a guy on the same course as me. Who said I've I'm in New Digs near Bounds Green um, in North London, and he says my landlady is the sister of Christine Perfect from Chicken Shack, or possibly had gone into Fleetwood Mac at that point. Yeah, I don't yeah, know, yeah, but yeah. but the point point being, you know, it was Christine Perfect, and I was because I was the kind of person who read The Enemy and Melody Maker and all. I knew who Christine Perfect was, and I was kind of impressed. You know, is she ever there? Oh yeah, she's turned up occasionally and so forth. You know, and uh, you know, the only claim to fame was that you know, <laughs> runner up in the Melody Maker kind of best female vocal or whatever. And uh, I'd rather go blind it and probably on the radio, but pretty obscure anyway. Yeah. Anyway, that road is not far from where I live still. I drive down that road or to get on the bus down that road regularly. There is not one occasion I go down that road where I don't think, think. this is where Christine McVie's sister was Nick Curry's landlady. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the idea that all these years later, when she died, 
this is major news on yeah. all the news networks, on all the newspapers. You know, it, 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 from from that tiny in 1972, it was. Well, she's you know she's she's the she plays piano with Chicken Shack, and she'd had a had a single called "Under on the Go Blind," which got a bit of radio play and probably sold a few copies, not an awful lot of whatever. It was the it was the the image of a kind of modest little career, and and you know those were the days back in those days when like you know, I don't know Jimi Hendrix or whatever died, even that barely got on the got on the news. In those no, days. it was a music that, music store, a rock music store. It was it, it was underground. Yeah. You know, don't forget. You know, Jim Morrison dies in 1971. It takes two weeks for the news to get from Paris to London. Two weeks. Yeah. You know, for everybody to decide that's a big story. Whereas nowadays, all these years later, Chris V dies. You know, in her late 70s, and it's absolutely massive news. Just to, which just seems extraordinary reflection of uh, of the kind of scale of the of the effect of the career that she had, you know, and um, and we were talking about Wilco Johnson last week, you know, my children I described them as children, they're kind of middle aged <laughs> adults, whatever. Yeah, yeah. They won't know anything about Wilco Johnson at all. Christine McVie, they'll know. Totally different story. Oh, absolutely. Totally different story. Oh, yeah, because yeah. Because that seeped into everybody's lives, probably more now than, than 30, 40 years ago. But none of the bits really look at that early period, actually, which is a shame because she was so hip. Wasn't she just the hippest thing? Oh, yeah. With yeah, her yeah. kind of mod clothes with a black mascara and a little ball. And the, her, the famous, know, the famous picture and... on the cover of, uh, of her album, her solo album on Blue Horizon. Which has her sitting by a lake, um, sitting in a kind of Derek Taylor wicker work. That's right. Yeah, you know, because yeah. that was that was the hippie chair. That was that was, was the chair. That was the chair everybody wanted. If you had yeah, long yeah, hair, yeah, yeah. that was the chair that you wanted, and you didn't have. You know, only hip people sat in the chairs like that. Yeah, no, oh, she yeah. was amazing, and she was so sweet. She talking about her relationship with John uh, John McVie because you know she kind of she fell for John McVie, but she was besotted with Peter Green, absolutely besotted with Peter Green, and said uh, to me, and I think this said a couple of times before, but the the, the 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 night before she got married to John McVie, that Peter Green had rung her up and said it wasn't too late to think again. <laughs> Oh, what, really? what a disorientating thing to do, you know? Oh dear, and I thought right, she was very interesting because she was quite she's quite it seemed so regular. You know, and so kind of down to earth, and yet was obviously completely magnetically attracted to these really, really high rolling exhibitionist, show off eccentric nutters. I mean, she was a member of the um, what were they cl- called? There was a club, the John Mayles House. Yeah, they were called the Brain Damage Club, and they had regular meetings. And, and, and successful members were those who jumped off the third floor balcony into the pool below without sustaining a head injury. Oh my God. I mean, no, no, no. no. no I mean, they weren't obviously going to get a head injury, but it was kind of, kind of was that kind of, you know, that kind of level of danger and excitement. And went out with Dennis Wilson for quite a long time. You know, Dennis, Dennis Wilson. Wilson. For God's sake, Dennis it Wilson. There can't have been a lot of going out with involved no, in no, Dennis no, no. Wilson. Are you, you wouldn't have gone to the pictures and out for a nice meal, would you? Really, no, no, you Dennis wouldn't. Wilson. No, 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 not really. Wasn't remotely. there some bizarre wasn't he wasn't he was he killed diving for something for her? Dennis Wilson died. And we, I talked about this uh, with her too, actually, and because she they'd stopped going out with her. But Dennis Wilson was in his yacht in Marina del Rey. Marina del was, Rey, yes. And he was swimming, very, very, very pissed. And he was swimming and he went down underneath the yacht, uh, which was its normal anchor, and he found on the seabed all these Belongings, you know, there was a, a broken uh, frame of a photograph of him and his uh, then girlfriend or wife, I can't remember now. And then obviously had a domestic and a load of stuff being chucked over the edge of the boat. And he suddenly came up, spookily appeared out of the water holding, I think, this framed photograph and then disappeared and was never seen alive again. You know, I mean, unbelievably extraordinary stuff. Oh, dear, dear. But she was very, you know, she was just terribly in awe of that kind of world, but not really kind of part. She, you know, all that chaos was going on in, in Fleetwood Mac, and yet she did didn't appear to be that directly involved, did she? Seemed to be the others, really. Well, she she took up with the um, the lighting lighting man, guy the, who she um, wrote. Um, you make loving fun. I think it was written um, about him, wasn't it? Yeah. Which yeah. John McVie then had to play the bass part on stage, knowing this was about this guy. Very very difficult. 
Oh, I, was I, look, was I, was look, I was looking at two bits of film, which you can find on YouTube if you look hard enough. I'm looking at them this week. And one's from 1970, I think. And it's got Fleetwood Mac as it was at the time, which is, um, I don't know if Peter Green's there, but Jeremy Spencer's certainly there, John McVie and Mick Fleetwood, and, uh, and Christine Perfect. And they're, they're, they're arriving in some kind of mini mope in the to the they all lived in a house together didn't they down they did. in kent or somewhere like well, that well kiln house they lived in for a while didn't okay they? this was the that was the, the british end of it wasn't it yeah okay and uh and they clearly it was it was just kind of mad hippie commune you know with with kind of no refinements whatsoever yeah. clearly cleaning no heating in the place probably not a washing machine or anything like that you know and they're there and there's dogs and and flaxen haired children and and the yeah, hippie this is the place she did the illustration for the cover didn't she That's well right. i don't know yeah. but anyway this is i was just looking at this this kind of thing and you, you're thinking this looks like a group with no hope at all this looks like a group that is going to go nowhere whatsoever and they then you know embark on this kind of three or four year period where they just keep in the states and they keep cranking out records you know i don't know it's kiln houses heroes are hard to find penguin all these kind of things that all used to get kind of sort of respectful reviews in rolling stone but nothing more than that really and I don't think I'd ever heard them. And I happened to hear a compilation of those records only the other day. These are the in-between Fleetwood Mac records, the kind of in-between the Peter Green, Albatross, Glory Days, and the Buckingham Knicks, you know, resurgence. And I listened to them, and I thought, it's not very good, actually, <laughs> this stuff. It just doesn't really make no, it. No, I've heard this. They're transformed by meeting Buckingham and Nick's. And and it's just it's an incredible story that, that you've got a, a kind of rhythm section yeah. without a front line, and you've got a front line needing a backing band. And, uh, you know, one's American with all that kind of fra- flash and and And, and he's younger. And he's younger. younger. Yeah, fabulous looking. You know, Fabulous and looking. And then you've makes got a big the back difference. line of old pros kind of, uh, you know, labouring away. It's just the most and brilliant it, it combination. Comes together. Anyway, the two bits of film. So that's the one where they look like it's, it's, it's like black and white Britain and, you know, kind of 1970. You can feel the kind of, you can feel the strikes yeah. and the damp and the yeah, superannuated yeah, yeah. Scotch egg sweating, sweating under <laughs> a kind of plastic cover on the on the on the counter of the bar or whatever and the other piece of film is i think probably 1978 nine or whatever and it's shot in an enormous great stadium in california where they are recording the high the the, the massed bands of the university of southern california doing the drumming track for tusk that's right they're all this. playing the same thing i've seen it it's amazing and, and there they are, the members of Fleetwood Mac swanning around, looking like the most gilded people you've ever yeah. seen in your life. And and Christine McVie is there with a huge, great balloon glass of no doubt really, really fine wine yeah. in, the, in the boiling sunshine. And you're just thinking, top of the world. That is absolute top of the world. And what a contrast. To what Completely. A, you know, what a exactly, comma. because no, nobody had paid their dues more than, no. I mean, that just that whole world of the comma vans and the lugging the amps and all that. She had really been through it, you know. And so Absolutely. they went mad. They just, they went mad because they just couldn't believe it had happened. And the, the heavens opened and it just rained uh, unlimited cash. I mean, b- 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 quantities of cash that are just impossible to imagine. There was nothing like it. When she was going out with... Um, was it Don Henley now? Am I getting am I imagine it? Didn't she go out with Don Henley once? I don't know. Most I people remember. did. It was it was considered so. it was considered to polite. To pick her up, I think it's just, just to pick her up and bring her over for the afternoon, you know, fantastic they could go out. Oh, it's just an amazing life. But she was she was so at the at the end of this interview, I remember asking why she'd given it all up. And I just reading what she said, it was so it's such an honest thing to say. She said, uh, she said, for some people, this is their life. She said to get on those boards, to have the light shining on them. 
And some people never even reached that point. And for me, that day had come. I hated LA. I hated living out in the suitcase. I hated, I hated flying. So there were tiny moments on stage where you get that feeling of magic. But otherwise, you're just going through the motion. So I start to feel a bit dizzy, to be honest, under the lights, the vibration of the boards, the volume, the heat. They start to make me feel a little unwell. I just had enough. I didn't want to have any of that noise anymore. Really interesting that because, you know, you just uh, you can imagine if you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, it must become so routine. So she then, couldn't bear to do it anymore. And then suddenly just woke up to gig. I, I, I must get back into it. You know, this is it. She volunteered to join the group. Uh, I think in 2014 for an encore or something. And then pretty much that night said, look, I tell you what, I can stay if you want. And they'd invited her to anyway. Amazing. And I can really understand that. You know, I understand that with with any of these musicians that it's so hard to give it up because that that irreplaceable sense of what it's like to be able to be part of that gang, to be in a world where everything's looked after. It's Bob Dylan, isn't it? Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan can't stop touring partly because all he has to do is be Bob Dylan for two hours a day on stage. And the rest of the world is completely sorted out for him. He's ferried around, isn't he? You know what I mean? He's just you know you're not sitting at home thinking right, what's next? Do I learn to play the oboe? Do I take up, you know, do I learn Chinese texts? Do I, what do I do? You know, Is that what you're doing? Book? Oh, no, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> no, she uh, was fantastic. It's, it's an extraordinary so nice life. All that. Um, it's so nice to see the amount of um, amount of, uh, of, of of publicity. Well, not publicity is the wrong word. The amount of coverage. <laughs> it's no use to you. Sorry. So you see at that point. Coverage Mark. that she's getting. I, I, don't know. I mean, to, to be fair, I mean, she, you know, couldn't have complained that she wasn't given her due during her life absolutely because she was she was know. and also yeah. the rare I mean, thing of being out of the group for 15 years or whatever it was was it that long it's 15 years yeah and then rejoined it i mean i try to think of someone else who'd done that has anybody else been out of a group for that long and gone back in straight in the deep end into a world tour i don't know i can't Amazing. think of one i Pretty can't think of one extraordinary extraordinary life the word podcast Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. One other thing, a story I think has been repeated a bit uh, in the last couple of days, and rightly so, because it's such a great story, I think. It's about her writing Songbird. Do you remember that when she was writing Songbird? And she she wrote it about, uh, they're right in the middle of the, of the of the album session. She go, went home and about one o'clock in the morning wrote this song, wrote it really, really quickly, wrote the, the whole chord sequence and most of the lyrics. And she found she had no recording equipment in the flat. And she's there on her own. She she just decided that the only way she thought, this is a really good song. I cannot, cannot let this go. So what she claimed to have done was to have stayed up all night and just playing it over and over and over again, jumped in a cab, humming this thing to herself as she went in the cab to the, the, the studio the next morning where the engineers had agreed to meet her early. And on a two-track tape, bang down the basic demo for the song. It's an amazing thing. <laughs> That's an extraordinary story. It's extraordinary. It's I, was just, just, I was only listening to uh, Fleetwood Mac demos um, today, and de- demos from Rumours and from Tusk. Yeah. And it's extraordinary how much of it is there in the demos. Yeah. You know, it, it, the finished records are, you know, the sweet touches, the kind of glistening surface the thing is, is put there in the in the final record. But the basic songs are are all there in the demos, and uh, you know, it's just testament to how how good they all were. And I tell you what, I was listening to um, Tusk. I've got I've got my copy of Tusk here, which is still the strangest uh, you know album cover, which has the the dog tugging the. Tugging the um, tugging the jeans leg of the engineer, I think, and uh, you know this was the most eagerly awaited. I, I go further. It, it's, it's the most eagerly awaited rock record ever because it came after Fleetwood oh, Mac and Rumors. Yeah, yeah, and they'd sold quantities that nobody could imagine ever, anything ever selling, and so they're making another record. It was a they're, miserable they're, disappointment. They're taking it. Yeah. Well, it. It was only a relative disappointment because it sold a mere four million rather yeah, than true. twenty-eight or whatever, and and it was a double album. But it's it's kind of interesting to me to listen to it because Fleetwood Mac have got this reputation as being the kind of corporate rock, if you like, you know, big record company, huge, great budgets, all those kind of things. But as when they did things, they did things in the most indie way possible. 
you know, Warner Brothers, who were the record company, never heard any of those records until they were finished. That's they, right. they, they, they simply did, presented them. There, there was, was no A&R. Come was in. No That's A&R. Right. There was no Nobody said I can't hear a single. Exactly. No involvement. And, and you can tell that, and this is the amazing thing, that they put out Tusk, and it's a double album, which for a start is for a record company is a nightmare to market. And, you know, record companies always want to, want, want to know the answer to the same thing is, what's the single? You know? Yeah. Like, and um, it starts with a Christian McVie song called Over and Over, which is just really kind of mid-paced, slow to start, long intro. You know, if ever a, a, a tune would seem that it's its proper place in the middle of side two, it's over and over. Yeah. But no, they had decided we're going to start like that. And every time I listen to it, I think to myself, what must it have been like when they played this to the sales force, Warner Brothers, in whenever it was at the time? But they just, they had the nerve to do the yeah. things that they wanted to do. And they didn't complain when it only sold four million, you know, because no, only, it was the record they wanted to make. Exactly. It was the record they wanted to make. They could afford not to complain, admittedly, but that's great. And it's a, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic song. It's a fantastic it record. And that took age was so crafted for so long, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. At a, at a very slight tangent, we had... Um, a very nice geezer on uh, Kevin Walsh uh, the other day on on the birthday slot. Oh yeah, yeah. And recommending uh, records, and uh, I went and listened to uh, the record he recommended. It was called "Electric Arguments" by the Firemen. Yes, it came out in two thousand eight. I don't know if you heard it too, because he was really. I did. I it did. Was really, really good. It's a record label. The Firemen was the group that Paul McCartney and, and Youth uh, formed. They made three records, actually, I think. And uh, Youth was in Killing Joke and Brilliant, and he was the producer of, um, you know, Bittersweet Symphony and all that Crowded sort of stuff. House. And yeah. just re- Crowded House. Just such a really interesting idea that what McCartney wanted after all that year, those years of kind of craft, was to go to the studio with nothing with nothing prepared at all, no ideas. And you would play them. He said, I said, I, I, I would, I'd bring down these poetry books or I'd play them some really old traditional folk music and I'd say, listen to this story or see if you can write some words or just listen to these, these this bit of music and see if anything springs up. And he had kind of in 10 minutes, McCartney would have to just spontaneously conjure up, synthesize, improvise out of thin air some uh, some some words and, and some some music. I think it's a really, really interesting record. I really enjoyed listening to it. There's some William Burroughs cut-ups on it, you know. There's all sorts of weird random times. And it springs from that kind of place where um you know the experimental things that they probably they do, you know, Carnival of Light, not that we've ever heard it, you know, uh, Tomorrow Never Knows, just things, just getting an idea and going with it, you know. And I think it's, I really recommend it. It's really interesting. It's, a, it's a, lots of acoustic guitar, folk tunes, a little pastoral ambit. It's, I tell you what I like about this record. It, it's, it, it, it's not beseeching you to like it. It's not finished. It's not crafted. It's not kind of a, there it is, you know, admire this beautiful thing. It's just raw and it's knocked out and it's improvised. And it's, it's just a really, it's not, it's not overall. It's under. I'll tell you what's a similar record actually, which, uh, well, youth wasn't involved with it, but yeah. uh, talking of youth, the first Finn brothers record, which oh, yeah. is called Finn. And that's, that's got that feeling. Yeah, it's, kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. it's not quite finished, and that's part of the charm of it. It's kind of, yes. you know, it's work in progress kind of thing. Yeah. But anyway, if you if you want a, a further reason to be a Patreon supporter, if you're a Patreon supporter and you're on the birthday tier, that's a new benefit. You can now plug us on a record in the course of your uh, in the course of your birthday uh, you know, recording. And we may well go and listen to it and enthuse about it. So worth doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Worth doing. The Word Podcast, driving the digital kids to school since 2007. Any other business, we're joined by Alex Gold. Uh, There's a bit of a kind of musical accounting that takes place this time every year. If you happen to be a user of Spotify, it's a very neat idea here. They, They provide to you a link where you can see the things that you've played most of in the last year, which won't necessarily be the things you think you've played most of, but it will be an actual but, record. But it's uh, presented as the, a festival poster, isn't it? Yes. Now, so it comes up festival lineup. Insta fest. Now, well, I think that's different. I think that may be done. I, I, oh, I, okay. I may be talking about, I've got, I'm looking at Spotify as my top songs for 2022. And so, 
Let me do this first, and then we'll come to the Instafest okay. thing in a second, which is no doubt based on your uh, your liking of acts. Um, my, my top uh, tune for last year, actually, I'm sad to say it's no longer the top tune, was actually Julie Andrews and Do, Do a Deer, a female oh, deer. Oh, lovely. From, from the soundtrack of The Sound of Music, because obviously... Second only the Teddy Bear's Picnic or whatever. Yeah, that, was, yeah. that was granddaughter's favourite tune, yeah. you know, so whenever they were here... They wanted to listen to that, so that ended up being my number one. Shall I give you my top ten for Go this on. year in reverse? Oh, I can't go. I can't see the old ten. I'll give her my top five. <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> Deed I Do by Blossom Deary. The best part of ba- Breaking Up by the Ronettes. Uh, a bit of soundtrack music by Miles Davis. And then Van Morrison doing I'll Tell Me Ma with the Chieftains. Oh, and, fi- wow. and finally, number one, my most played Spotify tune of the year 2022 is uh, is the soundtrack is Ryuichi Sakamoto and the soundtrack for The Last Emperor. Amazing. Of course, of course it is. Yeah. It's just, of course it is. But, that, but I've just played probably it. what alone. you write like, to. You probably, it's probably background music, isn't it? I just like it. I really yeah. like it. It's there. And, and so you've done InstaFest. Tell me about that. Go on. Well, InstaFest, as far as I can see, it's, it's, an, it's an app, isn't it, Magic? You just you just click on this this app and it will, it keys into your Spotify playlist. It writes out as a um, as a festival poster, Friday night with its headliners and support acts. Saturday night, Sunday night, um, all your favourite acts, which is very peculiar. I don't know what yours are like, uh, Magic, but mine are you know, really, really unrepresentative of, of kind of the things that I normally like. There's one of the big names in mine is Peter Duncan because Peter Duncan is the guy from Blue Peter who, who produced <laughs> a lot of music, some of which has been written by my son. So oh, there you, you go. You know, yeah, for his <laughs> pantomime. So I want to be listening to this. But no, my main things are bizarre things. It's the Beatles and it's, you know, it's Bob Dylan and people like that, but it's the Ronettes. Jonathan Richmond, great to see you in there. Louis Jordan, apparently I play all the time. Dan Hicks and his hot licks, James Brown. It's, I don't know, it's just weird combinations of stuff. What have you got in yours? Well, uh, the thing is, I, I use Spotify for work an awful lot because I have to learn pieces of music and it's just where I can find everything. So I don't... The thing about my relationship is with Spotify is I don't really have a relationship with it as a listener as such. Yeah. So my top, so my my top head festival headliners for 2022 on the on the on the Thursday we've got the Small Faces. Oh, <laughs> good, of course. On the Friday we've got the Beatles, yeah. of course. <laughs> and on great. a Saturday we've got Oasis, Rolling Hello. Stones. Uh, no. <laughs> Go it's on. Even better, the Cortinas. The Cortinas, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Who I've, I've got to say, you've been save the best for last. I've never Spotify in my yeah. life before I had to learn three Quarantina songs for a wedding in June. That's so, fantastic. Uh, it's really, really bizarre because yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it does make you look back on your year in a particular way. There's stuff on there I, I'm absolutely sure I haven't Spotify, but apparently I have. But I'm just having a look at the um, my year wrapped as well, and that's really... It, it kind of well, my my, my fifth top listened to song is um, a cheesy Euro pop na- uh, Neapolitan um, soap number called uh, O Matrimonio Neapolitano, which is a which is a was a which is a Neapolitan wedding song that I had to learn for this. Because you played wow. a Neapolitan wedding, didn't you? So it did, it, exactly. Yes, you did. So. Yeah, so my, my, my year's been really weird, actually. Uh, I'm just having a look at it now. Lots of small faces in there, lots of Beatles. The top, my top song of uh, 2022 apparently is The Milkman of Human Kindness. And I can tell you why, why this is. It's because whenever I put my... I've got a playlist called Good Shit on Spotify, and it's about 800 songs long. It's all my favourite stuff over about 10 years. And whenever I put it on shuffle, for some reason, The Milkman of Human Kindness... Billy Bragg. It keeps me ranging back every, yeah, every five yeah, or six yeah. songs. I don't know why. Um, so how wonderful! Yeah, it's a great my, phone, my phone's ringing. I've got to go. This podcast was brought to you by the Word. <laughs> <laughs>